Hello and welcome to The Play Review with me, Douglas Schatz. And me, Jodie Rylett. Hi, Jodie. Hi, Douglas. How are you doing? Great, thank you. It's good to be talking about plays again. It feels like a while. Yes, I'm just resurfacing after several days devoted to recording and editing our episode of The Play Podcast on King Lear which was a daunting challenge, but hugely stimulating. But I'm very happy to have a change of pace I bet. with our play under review today, which is Lynn Nottage's play Clyde's, which is currently on stage at the Don Mar Warehouse Theatre. The show is directed by Lynette Linton, who directed Nottage's last play at the Don Mar, Sweat, back in 2018, which I thought was a fabulous show. Clyde's premiered on Broadway in November 2021 and was nominated for four Tony Awards in 2022. According to American Theatre Magazine, it was the most produced play in nonprofit theatres in America in 2022-23. So there's something about this play that touches a nerve, obviously. Lynn Nottage is very well known in America, having won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama twice in 2009 for her play Ruined, and in 2017 for Sweat. Her work often focuses on the experience of working class people, particularly those who are black. Sweat, for example, is set in the town of Reading, Pennsylvania, in the heart of what is known as the American Rust Belt, and it charts the devastation that is wrecked on the community in Reading when the local steel factory is threatened with closure. In fact, Clyde's is set in the same town of Reading. And the title is the name of the truck stop diner on the outskirts of town that belongs to Clyde. I say it belongs to Clyde. In fact, it isn't entirely hers because she's beholden to unseen and not especially benign investors who backed her to set it up. Clyde being a former prisoner in the local penitentiary. And in fact, all of her staff and the four other characters in the play are also ex-cons. This being one of the only places that they have had a chance to get work following their release. The stories and characters of both Sweat and this play are based on extensive research Nottage carried out in Reading in the 2010s, and I think the plays certainly have the stamp of lived reality. So, Jody, what attracted you to want to see Clyde's? Did you see Sweat when it was on here, perchance? I did. Yeah, I did indeed. I loved it. I bought the play text. It's on my shelf over there. Me too. Yeah, it was a real standout play for me. So I was really excited to see Clyde's. And it's been a particularly busy period for me with work and a show that I'm involved in at the moment. And I managed to sneak in a little matinee, which always feels like so naughty, doesn't it? In the middle of the working day. Yeah. So I was that desperate to see it. And I was not disappointed. Great. Let's talk first about the setup. I introduced the premise of the play, but what about the set and the design that you see when you come into the Don Mar? Yeah, it's on three sides. And if you imagine what we would say is the back wall, it's set up as the serving hatch from the kitchen into the restaurant. And the main stage is essentially the kitchen in the back of this, what we would call a greasy spoon in the UK, but is is this truck stop diner. And there are two, I guess, chef's preparation benches, you would call them, a setup. And against the back wall, there's more preparation space, there's a fridge, etc. So you are very immediately in a working space in a kitchen. And in, there's a big neon sign saying Clyde's above it. So straight away, you know where you are. Yeah. So the entire plate takes place in this kitchen in the back of the diner. And the characters work there as short order cooks, mainly preparing sandwiches yes because there's a lot about the sandwiches and the food that they prepare in this play and actually first the most amazing thing you can't help but marvel at the logistics of all of this and think about what they're having to deal with oh my goodness because the cast are making sandwiches throughout this play using real ingredients from the tubs that are set up in their tables yeah that's the real thing isn't it it is the real thing it's not only the choreography of dealing with actual food and all the myriad of things that could possibly go wrong with that. They're also simulating being in a busy kitchen. At one point, there's the most beautiful piece of choreography where those two workbenches separate into four and they're all on wheels and the four chefs are moving those tables around in a circle and jumping from one table to another. 
it was a thing of beauty to behold the way that they did that. And and not so much as a piece of lettuce fell on the floor. Yes, you're right. That was a beautiful moment. And, and in fact, it gives us a moment to give credit to Lynette Linton, who does a lovely job directing this show, I think, yeah. for that being one of the examples, because it's full of energy and this fluid movement and the music as well that she uses lifts the show. But yeah, just marvelous to watch the way she choreographs that and... There are other times when, for example, the lead character, whose name I got to get right here. Montrellis. Montrellis, yes, who is a bit of a maestro at making sandwiches. And it's beautiful to watch his movement when he is making a sandwich because he does it with such love. He has this sort of exaggerated, very graceful way of moving, including, for example, dropping the seasoning or herbs from a great height from his outstretched arm very delicately. That's right. So there's something really poetic about the way she directs him to move. It's poetic and spiritual, and it's all done under this exquisite light that's upon him. And it elevates this whole idea. Of course, it's not about making sandwiches. (laughs) It is, of course, about how much work can build self-esteem and how much we need that and getting better at things and having a purpose and how all of these things build a human being. Yes, of course, sandwiches become a metaphor, don't they, or a symbol for all sorts of things, for control and order and creativity and discipline in their lives, which have otherwise not been any of that. And also for individual self-expression, because Montrellis inspires them to invent their own sandwiches, which gives them an opportunity for creativity and something that they can take pride in and rebuild their self-worth and find some ability to move on and define themselves as something different and more positive than the ex-convicts that they have been, which is very hard to do, both literally because it's stacked against them in terms of finding employment and a way back into the world, but also their mental states, their confidence is shot. Yeah. And they don't really know where to turn for their futures. It's very moving in that regard. But the sandwiches become a very powerful symbol for their potential. Yeah, absolutely. And and the character Jason, who's, as you have in many plays, the newcomer into the setup, is treated with enormous suspicion. And it's almost like there has to be a rite of passage that you have to go through before you will be accepted by the group, which I'm sure emulates how it probably was from their experiences in prison. He's got these tattoos on his face that say he has a history of being in a gang and it's a gang that's a white supremacist and it's literally written all over his face. And at one point he says just that he's worthless. I am worthless. I've always been treated this way. And it's really heartfelt and in more clumsy hands. It could have been pathetic, but it absolutely wasn't. It was just so beautifully wrought. And I was very moved by that. Yes, I thought Patrick Gibson, who is Jason, captured that vulnerability as well as, you know, he's protecting himself with a kind of sullenness and bravado, but he's wired pretty tightly. He really is. He just wants to keep his head down, doesn't he? He does not want to get into any more trouble. He wants to move past it, but he plays it so well. You feel at any moment the next jibe could be the one that triggers a moment of extreme violence. Yes, because that's what's happened in his past, right? Yeah. He's been part of these gangs, and in some moment, he's just exploded and been guilty of aggravated assault. What about the rest of the cast? We mentioned Montrellis, who is played by Giles Torreira. He's always a joy. Isn't he? Whatever you see him in, he's just worth the ticket. At first, I was thinking, oh, no, please don't underuse him, because actually he doesn't appear so much in the first half of the play as he does in the second So I thought he played the very right balance between, of course, it's slightly ridiculous that an individual could take a sandwich so seriously. There's an inherent comedy about that, but in playing it straight, it just worked for the story. And he has a real presence where you can imagine that these younger characters around him who all look up to him are drawn to his serenity, his words of wisdom They absolutely idolise him. He's sort of like this urban guru that they all aspire to be. And they don't know the story. One of their rituals is that they all share the story about what put them away, why they spent time inside. 
his story has never been shared. Although I now realise as I'm talking about it, as the play opens, I think he's just finished telling Clyde his story. Yes, yes, yes. There's a sort of jump back in time structure to the way it's set up. But you're right. He is just magnetic and commanding on stage, as the maestro should be. And he has this sort of evangelical quality. He's absolutely spellbinding. He's like a religious orator or something. And we fall for it, too. Yeah, we buy into it. (laughs) Absolutely do. Part of this is actually just food porn as well. (laughs) The language is absolutely fantastic. The way he particularly describes the ingredients in such loving terms of the sandwich he invents. There's one I just picked out here. This is Maine lobster, potato roll gently toasted and buttered with roasted garlic, paprika and cracked pepper with truffle mayo. Oh, man, I want that sandwich so badly. <laughs> it's mouthwatering, isn't it? And I saw in the program at the Don Mar, they actually have three recipes for the sandwiches are mentioned, which I was pretty tempted to make. <laughs> anyway, going back to the performances, what about Clyde? the eponymous owner of this diner. She's a tough cookie, isn't she? She's so tough. And you're left in no doubt from the very first moment she opens her mouth. Montalas has just finished telling this very heartfelt story. And her response is, I could not care less. She has zero interest in other human beings, in their stories. She's got a job to do. Go make your sandwiches. You'd think on the face of it, she's an ex-con. She is employing ex-cons, the trope would be that she is a compassionate person, a tough love kind of person who's bringing these people in out of the kindness of her heart. But actually, she enjoys the power of it. She enjoys putting other people down. That doesn't mean to say it's not an absolute joy to watch her in her outrageousness. I mean, it makes Gordon Ramsay look like a sweetheart in the kitchen. (laughs) She must have loved playing it. It's Benisola Ikemelo, who is a comedy actress. She knows what she is doing with a part like that, and she was relishing every moment of it. Yeah, she was nailing that. And you're right, you keep looking for that soft centre somewhere, that something's happened in her past, that she has to adopt this persona, this carapace, and that she won't let any light in. Montrellis wants her to look at being more creative with the menu and to change the character of the place. It's a basic truck stop and they're just slinging out ham and cheese sandwiches or burgers or whatever. And he's creating all these lovely new sandwiches. They keep trying to get her to taste one to try and convince her. And at one moment, it looks like she's going to. And you're thinking, oh, okay, here's a breakthrough. And then she just throws it on the floor in complete disdain. And they and we were sucked into thinking, okay, here's the moment where she's won over. But oh, no, shockingly disabused of that. Yes, absolutely. We weren't going to go for anything as expected as that in this play at all. No. What about the other two characters? We have Raphael, Sebastian Orozco. I think he's such a good actor. He's got this beautiful, again, a vulnerability about him. He's very flirtatious with Letitia. He clearly wants to win her over. So it's easy at first to put him down as just a kind of, you know, a macho male just looking for a conquest. But he's got such a lovely heart. And you learn that he's conquered his alcohol and drug dependency that got him into trouble in the first instance. And he really believes and buys into this idea of he's desperate to make the perfect sandwich. And you feel crushed for him when he doesn't make his sandwich perfect. Yes. Well, he's setting himself up for a fall, though, in some senses. He's almost too vulnerable because he's desperate for Montrellis's respect. But he also, of course, is holding a candle for Letitia, who does not certainly initially register or reciprocate his feelings. At least she doesn't allow herself to. So, yeah, there's potential heartbreak there, too. And Letitia is played by Ronke Adekalujo. Yeah, and she is a powerhouse of energy and bounce and vitality and completely possessed of her confidence and her femininity. I mean, she takes no prisoners. I certainly would not want to get on the wrong side of her. Yet you learn she's a single mum. You learn that she has an ex-boyfriend who's probably been quite abusive and probably wiggles his way in and out of her life whenever it suits him. Predictably unreliable. And her child needs special care. So, yes, for all this strength, 
she's up against it and struggling to keep it all together. And that's also very moving, actually, I think, the glimpses of what she's having to deal with. And in fact, that's one of the main themes of the play is that they are dealing with some real challenges, these characters. This is a glimpse of the American prison system. There's a statistic in the Donmar program that says that 75% of former prisoners in the U.S. penal system are back in prison within five years. And that it's even more than that for individuals of the global majority. And this is one of the glimpses into how this affects individual human beings who get caught up in it. You get these little glimpses into how it must be. And it's done with such a lightness of touch. But they all talk about the day that they came out with their $75 it's in their pocket, essentially to find their first night's accommodation and put food in their mouth. And beyond that, you are on your own. So if you have no support network, no family, no friends, no anything, that's it. Actually, you know, while I was watching the show, there were so many great lines that jumped out. It's very well written. One of which was, I think I'm paraphrasing this, just because you've left prison doesn't mean you've escaped prison. Pretty telling. Yeah. I just feel like Lynn Nostra's work is just so important in bringing a story that we otherwise wouldn't see to an audience that wouldn't necessarily have that life experience. It does what great drama can do, which is through individual stories, shows us something more about the bigger world and what others will be going through. I wondered at times where I thought the play felt a little bit like a sitcom, and I wondered what the central drive of it was. But actually, thematically, of course, in the end, it, it is, as you said earlier, simply about how we make the most of what we can to try and hold on to and follow a dream, any dream, perhaps, that will give us some self-respect in the face of real challenges of everyday life. And that's pretty life-affirming. Exactly. And I, I know exactly what you mean, that sense of, yeah, what is this really about? And at the end, I had thoroughly enjoyed it, but I did come out thinking, did it lack drama? I think what happens, though, is that we're conditioned to expect a certain something. And this is quite telling for me about me. If I go and watch something that's about a bunch of ex-cons and there's lots of tension, I'm kind of expecting somebody to get stabbed. And when something massively violent, spoilers, but something massively violent in that sense does not occur, you almost think, oh, well, that wasn't very dramatic. Of course, I've since reflected and I keep thinking about it. And I think that is the cleverness of it, is that the real drama here doesn't need to be in any way amped up. Their lives could have been utterly, utterly meaningless, and they've found some meaning and purpose and community with one another. Yes, I think it's a very ordinary world that she's presenting and taking time to just observe what these real characters' ordinary lives are about. And initially, it took a little while, I think, for the play to get going in that respect and also to try and figure out what it is about. But even that all said, actually, the more we reflect on it, it's certainly staying with me. And it was really enjoyable for the top class performances and the direction this piece of theater is really well delivered. Yeah, the direction is impressive because I think it could be very easy to turn these characters into caricatures. And I think it says obviously a lot about the acting, but particularly about the deft direction that allowed you to see some light and shade in the characters, that they're not kind of stock characters on stage here, which would have been disrespectful, I think, if they were caricatures. Yes. And also, if she's using the stage so inventively, again, there's these freeze moments where we get a glimpse of their individual pasts, presumably in prison or part of their crime, perhaps. And that just makes it feel more real, it gets a bit darker, you realize what they have been through. So we recommend Clyde's, don't we, Jody? We recommend Clyde's. Who knew? that a parsley garnish should be the cause of out-and-out -out rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> Those details are important. Clyde's is running at the Donmar Warehouse until Saturday, the 2nd of December. And as an extra bonus, I will actually be talking with the show's director, Lynette Linton, about the play in more depth on the Play Podcast. Look out for that episode dropping before the end of November. Thanks for listening to another Play Review. Thanks, Jody. Great to see you. You too. Bye-bye. See you next time, everyone.
We'd love to hear what you think, so please visit theplaypodcast.com to share your comments or email us at plays at theplaypodcast.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.